This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to the Human Action Podcast. It is Friday, January 1st, 2021. I want to wish each and every one of you a very, very happy new year. And I want to thank you for listening over the past year as we have increasingly dedicated this podcast, this show, to a series of great books. As a matter of fact, the Human Action Podcast is all about books. It's about reading books, sometimes tough books, mostly economics, but also philosophy and history and related subjects. And it's been a great ride for those of you who have stuck with the show and worked our way through both Human Action and Man, Economy, and State this past year in multiple shows and multiple stages. So that was, it was a little bit of heavy lifting, but I think it was worth it. And I hope that this show encourages people to get out there to find original sources, to read primary sources, to become vigorous readers and thinkers, and to go beyond the superficial of our social media feeds and the nonsense coming at us in terms of white noise from 24-hour cable networks and the like. So all that said, we are going to do a bit of a retrospective and try to make the argument uh, for enlarging the scope of our listenership by getting people into reading serious books. And so I want to make the case for that. And I'm joined today by my good friend, Dr. Tom Wood. So Tom, welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. Well, I ran across the great quote today, Tom, by Ray Bradbury, the uh, sci-fi writer. I love him. He said, you don't have to get people to burn books to destroy culture, just get people to stop reading them. And I, I thought that was interesting because, I, you know, you and I struggle with this. There are a lot of people who see the world and the state in a manner much the way we do, and they can be very, very impatient and say, you know, 900-page books, Jeff, they just aren't cutting it anymore. We need activism. We need action. Uh, we need to be building institutions. We need to be building platforms. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes you even get this sense that, well, that, that stuff from the, the 20th century or even the 19th century, that's kind of old economics. And there's new economics today that we ought to be talking about. So there's also an element of presentism to all this. So I guess, you know, with that background, what's the Tom Woods case for actually taking the time and making the effort to read tough books? I'm getting this a lot, too, from people who say, look, it's this – strategy of yours is way too late. Right now, we are in the death throes of a civilization, and so we've got to do X, Y, or Z. But in my experience, that's just laziness. That's an excuse not to do anything, because these people who say, well, now we need to do X, Y, or Z, are not doing X, they're not doing Y, they're not doing Z, they're not doing anything, and they're not reading. So I don't go for that. And secondly, if you are in the death throes of a civilization, let's say that is the case, well, at some point, you're going to want to rebuild something, and you're going to have to rebuild that on some kind of foundation. How can you rebuild it if you haven't immersed yourself in the foundations on which you would want a civilization to be built? So I'm not going for any of these uh, defeatist reasons not to read. And then, of course, there are the, as you say, the, the, the presentist reasons. I think that's less likely to come from our people because a you know, in in some ways, the, the only good economist is a dead economist. And now that's not true anymore. We have some great Austrian ones out there. But you know what I mean, that I actually wouldn't want to be reading what the current people are, are writing all that much. I mean, you can get some insight from it, to be sure. But if you really want to be grounded step by step in the edifice of authentic economic thought, you're going to want to read older works. And then you can see how we build on those older works. But you're not going to read the classic texts of Austrian economics and feel like this was not a good use of your time. It's going to help you in multiple ways. You'll understand the world better. You'll be a better, I think you'll be a better writer because you're reading some really outstanding writers. I think Rothbard's best prose really is in his economic works. That's where he comes across so beautifully and elegantly. Same with Mises. And it's um, it, it, these are the kind of things that you want your children as they get older to absorb. So there's maybe you think it's hopeless to to bother reading because uh, of transgender bathrooms, but I don't think that way. And in particular, I think that my kids need to have even if even if I for some reason had given up on everything, my kids deserve better than that, and they should be immersed in it. And I I don't want my kids just to grow up to learn how to make widgets and how to you know, fit themselves into a, a factory job somewhere or just to master video games. I want them to know 
and to be absorbed in the great tradition of which they are a part. Well, the other thing, Tom, is throughout the last year, but also we've been doing this show a couple of years now, is we always find examples in every book where the author was particularly prescient. We always find things that absolutely apply in spades to what's going on today, whether we're talking about interest rates, whether we're talking about socialism, whether we're talking about market failure, or monopoly, or anything else. So that was always really the goal of the show, is to tie these books into uh, the real world, and also to, to bring them to life to, to an extent. In other words, so, some people who listen to the show probably won't read the book, so the show itself will serve as the cliff notes of a sort for the book. But more importantly, to just say, you know, if you pause for a minute, you only have so much time, you only have so much energy, you have a job, you might have a family, you might have a mortgage, you might have school, you might have all kinds of things in your life. And so life is about trade-offs. And in terms of your spare time and what you're reading, you can read uh, pop stuff, you can read garbage stuff, it's kind of like eating Doritos, or you can read tougher stuff that's kind of like eating your broccoli and going to the gym. But when you're done, you feel better. So, you know, it's hard to, I guess, argue that people ought to spend their spare time doing heavy intellectual lifting. It's not the easiest sell. I get that. So you can get around that in a a number of ways. For, For one thing, not every item you need to read has to be the heaviest thing we have to offer. You you don't have to read dense and heavy philosophical treatises all the time. You can you can intersperse that with some of the let's say the the sh- collections of short pieces by Rothbard that are going to teach you an awful lot and are going to point back to some of the larger texts, but that are also very entertaining and and uh, and, and enjoyable to read. Bob Murphy is an example of somebody who's a more recent thinker who's written a great many books that are very accessible that are not going to twist your brain into a pretzel and that are pleasurable to read. So, and you know, there is, you know, there's always old Woods here who tries to make books that uh, make the books into something that you you learn from and, and that there's, there isn't any fluff in, you're, you're really learning something on every page, but where you do feel nevertheless entertained, like the prose is punchy and, and keeps your attention. So I think we have ways to, to balance all this so that, so that even that can't be an excuse. Well, this argument you need to build your own institutions, I think we have done that to an extent. I mean, you have your Liberty Classroom. We have our new master's program, which is uh, absolutely going gangbusters. We have way more people signing up for it than we can accept uh, because it's very, very cheap and it's purely Austrian and uh, soon to be accredited, uh, already licensed. So it basically uh, gives you a master's degree in economics with an Austrian take uh, at a fraction of the cost of uh, going to a trad- traditional program somewhere and also, you know, completely online. You don't have to upright, uproot your life and move. You don't have to take out student loans, this sort of thing. But frankly, every week of uh, this show, the Human Action Podcast, all of our events, we managed to hold a bunch of live events, e- even in the midst of COVID around the country last year. And I'm saying last year, meaning yesterday. Uh, and so the, the idea here is to be a school of sorts, to be an alternative school that's free, that's accessible, that's online. And so when it comes to building your own institutions and what comes after, if we really are in this terrible crash, in this terrible malaise, you know, Tom, I've always had this sense, you know, you're familiar with the concept of accelerationism, that we envision this Mad Max scenario. And who wants that? Who wants to be planting a flag in the rubble and saying, see, Mises was right, <laughs> right? We don't want that. that. That's not the goal. The goal here is to say that human history has a lot of ups and downs. It has some sideways as well. And so this is the, this is the, you know, the lot we've, been, we've chosen, and we, we need to work within the scope of reality and try to make things better, regardless of whether it seems like things are particularly illiberal. When you look at the tone of some of Mises' work, he wasn't super optimistic a lot of the time. Yes, not a happy, and, clappy guy always. No, and yet he produced an awful lot. Now, I think Carl Menger was somewhat pessimistic, and may, maybe it was that he fell into despair, I don't know, but he he didn't produce nearly as much as Mises did, and yet they both looked at the world 
perhaps not very optimistically, but for whatever reason, Mises just carried on because, look, win or lose, I have to do what I feel morally obligated to do and, and what seems to be the task of the scholar. I have to carry it out, come what may. And maybe better days will come and people will appreciate what I'm doing, but I can't, it, it's like the Martin Luther quotation, you know, whether it's apocryphal or not, here I stand, I can do no other. Well, that's what that's how he felt in this situation. And then you have Murray Rothbard, who was much more optimistic in the long run, but even if he hadn't been, I think that was his feeling. Here I stand, I can do no other. I understand the world, I understand the interests at stake, I understand the nature of the state and that it's the opposite of what people think. I can't not tell people about that. And all you have to do is consume what they've written. And, and as you're consuming it, stop to appreciate the fact that sometimes it's it can be heavy lifting just to consume what they produced. Imagine the labor involved in producing it. Well, we also have to imagine that there are benefits to generations beyond our own lifetimes, right? We all benefit from writings of, of and knowledge of scholars, uh, you know, dozens or hundreds of years ago, in some cases, even thousands of years ago, and they, they produce something of lasting value for society. We're not year zero people. We actually believe in uh, benefiting from the total, the sum total of human knowledge. We're all standing on the shoulders of our ancestors, despite this, this crazed blank slate thinking. And so when it comes to building something beyond your own lifetime, I think that gives you a particular uh, a form of comfort. It, it helps you to feel like you're building something. Uh, people built cathedrals over a period of many, many hundreds of years, and somehow they stayed true to that original vision and managed to find the funding and managed to maintain the architectural pl plans and all this and that. And so they built something that's lasting. And so we have this presentist outlook where we imagine everything is new today and the old modes don't apply. And Tom, that isn't really true. The only thing that's new, that's constantly new, is technology. What is not new is uh, some sort of new economics or uh, new human nature or you know new way of organizing society between markets and the state. That, that's what I don't like in libertarian thought, which is hubris and the idea that we are sort of raising the past and building something brand new. Yes, indeed. And this is, I think, why there are, let's say, parts of the libertarian world that don't place as much emphasis on the old texts on which our tradition is based, and frankly, on reading, on, especially on reading these, uh, these, uh, all these older texts and honoring these people who gave them to us. And yeah, that's a problem. Now, on the other hand, there, of course, there are occasionally times in history when something genuinely new is produced. So the marginal revolution in uh, the 1870s, that really was something new under the sun in understanding economics. But they didn't chuck the entire inheritance of classical economics, and they didn't say there's absolutely nothing of value in any of this anymore. And they didn't, uh, you know, I mean, for example, Rothbard goes back and even 500 years to find pre-Austrian insights in the works of the late scholastics. So yes, occasionally there are innovations, but the innovations are usually building upon an existing structure, or they're, they're answering questions that were posed by a, a previous structure. And so in order to get the full picture of what's going on, you have to understand what came before it. So and th I think this, it's not a coincidence that the Austrians are among, let's say, the biggest supporters of the study of the history of economic thought who still remain. The history of ec economic thought in the f discipline within the, within the field of economics is viewed as a kind of a weird curiosity these days. Like, why would somebody want to study something like that? It used to be taken for granted that you would study that. It's not a surprise to me that the Austrians do that, partly because, as Rothbard said, it is possible that some great insights do get lost. Uh, the, the value theory of the classical economists was... Uh, you know, represented a loss of knowledge in some ways when you look at what the uh, late scholastics were saying. So we want to go and pick out what were the insights that got lost, because we don't have a Whig theory of history whereby everybody absorbs all of what is best in the predecessor and then continues on to the future. Not necessarily so. And so sometimes we want to go back and dig out what was what was lost in the past. But I guess for me, I just think about my own intellectual journey and the pure, I realize how nerdy this sounds, believe me, but 
once you're out of high school, you can be as much of a nerd as you want. Nobody, nobody's going to bother you about it anymore. You're not going to get made fun of or beat up or whatever. And I proudly say that I took immense intellectual pleasure from reading the works that were assigned to me at the Mises University program. Before you would attend the Mises University summer program, this was 1993, the first time I went, you should read certain texts. And then there were some recommended readings as well. Now, there was not really much of an internet in those days. So for me to track down some of these scholarly articles, not, not the stuff that you guys sent me in the mail, but the scholarly pieces, I had to go to an academic library and dig them out, and I dug them all out. And I found every article I could find, and I felt like with each one, I was being initiated into some secret teaching that had somehow been kept from the rest of my peers. And I, I just can't imagine not wanting to have that experience, because once you start having it, once you start heading down that path, you just can't stop. Well, it also shows it's never been easier to uh, obtain and access all these books. Oh, for heaven's sake, right. I mean, it, right at your fingertips, not only can you order them and have them shipped to your door, you can sometimes read them instantly online. And if you're a cheapskate, you can just print them all out and read them on paper. And a lot of times you can have them read to you because there are audio versions. And of course, at the Mises Institute, a lot of people, particularly Floyd Lilly, have gone to a lot of trouble to record these books. Man, Economy, and State and Human Action are available in audio format. That's amazing. These entire works can be listened to. So at this point, yeah, there really isn't much of an excuse. It's incredible how readily these resources are at your fingertips. Not to mention you can find courses, you can find discussion groups of people who want to talk about this stuff. So it's never been easier to learn and master it. Well, Tom, indulge me for a second, but I want to refresh the audience's memory. People who have stuck with the podcast over the, just the past year, just the past 12 months, I want to just quickly review what we've learned. I mean, Menger's Principles, which wasn't translated into English for almost 80 years. We went through Menger's Principles with Joe Salerno. We went through Mises' Theory of Money and Credit with Jeff Herbner up at Grove City, who's probably our best pure uh, time preference theory of interest guy. We went through socialism with Sean Rittenauer, also up at Grove City, really delved into some of the lesser discussed parts of that book. And that talk about prescient. That book basically predicted today's political correctness movement. Uh, we went through the, the second volume of the three-volume uh, Bomberwerk Capital and Interest Treatise, Again, with Jeff Herdner, so we learned all about interest in that. We went through uh, liberalism from the 1920s, Mises' book on political theory and uh, self-determination and secession with Ryan McMakin. We went through the ultimate foundation of economic science, which is his you know, uh, longest treatment of method and praxeology. We went through that with Joe Salerno, Bureaucracy, the great 1944 book based on his uh, experience with German officialdom. Well, Bill Anderson, we went through the anti-capitalistic mentality. We went through omnipotent government. Uh, Mark Thornton joined us to go through an essay on economic theory by Cantillon, uh, a book and, and a thinker about which Mark is an expert. We went through nation, state, and economy, again with Ryan McMakin. We went through Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson with Walter Block. Uh, we went through a proto book, which is now in its final stages, a, a, a serial book written by Bob Murphy called Understanding Money Mechanics. So we're going to produce that in physical form this year. Uh, obviously, we had a ton of guests as we broke up human action and man economy and state into multiple shows. We had people like Byland and uh, Klein and, of course, Tom Woods joining us today, David Gordon, Jonathan Newman, Patrick Newman, Christopher Hansen, uh, Bob, the aforementioned Bob Murphy. Uh, we went through uh, Hoppus Democracy, The God That Failed with Stephen Kinsella. We went through books by Per Bielen. We went through some uh, books – by folks on the left, including Stephanie Kelton's Deficit Myth and Nomi Prinz's Collusion, uh, we, uh, The Marginal Revolutionaries, written by a left academic up at uh, University of Alabama. I mean, that, you know, that's just about two-thirds of the book we did, books we did just this past year. So, you know, Tom, you put all that in a blender, and, and that's an advancement in your understanding uh, in just a year, even if you didn't read any of them and just listen to the podcast. And if you did read them, or if you read them in the past, not only is your memory refreshed, but I would love to hear the analysis of some of these texts by some of our people. 
And in some cases, in particular, books written by people we disagree with, yeah, I'd love to hear what, what Joe and Peter and Bob all think of these particular texts. I'd love to hear what David Gordon thinks about any book whatsoever in the entire universe. So I, I love the, first of all, I just love the idea of the podcast. Well, I have some books in mind for this coming year, but I'd like to hear some of your thoughts or suggestions on that score. Ah, uh, geez. Well, uh, do you want to hear my I... list? Do you want to hear my list first? Uh, sure. Uh, some definites. Okay. I, I have some definites. Why don't we start? I'll, with I'll that? make some notes. Okay. So we're definitely going to do Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations. We'll probably take more than one show for that. We're definitely going to do Keynes's General Theory. Um, I, I can't handle uh, Das Kapital because it's just it's just dreck. It's not. And even, it, even the Marxists don't read it. So why should we? It's not well yeah. written. Yeah. It's it's. Um, we're going to do a, a couple more Hoppe books. We're going to do a Theory of Socialism, Capitalism, and. The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. We'll probably do a couple more Edward Bernays books because I think uh, increasingly persuasion <laughs> is um, leading or, or a lack of persuasion is, is uh, perhaps giving rise to the need for separation. So uh, all of us understanding how language works uh, against what's happened, the madness out there, I think is important. We'll probably do a couple more James Burnham books. We'll do the Machiavellians for sure. Uh, and uh, beyond that, we'll probably get into some of the smaller Rothbard books as well. I haven't yet done The Ethics of Liberty just because it's, it's you know, obviously it's a normative book. It's fraught. Uh, and I, I've tried to be stay away from libertarian theory and stick more to economics, but we haven't always – stuck to that idea. So at some point, we definitely will have to work through the ethics of liberty. And then, of course, we've got a whole host of smaller Rothbard books. Uh, so there's, there's plenty to do. There's more books than there are weeks in the year. Yes, no kidding. Well, I'll mention that we did do, before there was a Jeff Deist at the Mises Institute, a, a video series where each of us talked about one chapter in Economics in One Lesson by Hazlitt. So that already exists. So we wouldn't need to probably need to reproduce that. I'm looking through some of the books that I myself list among the books that I recommend. And certainly I think those Hoppe books that you mentioned, the, A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism and The Economics and Ethics of Private Property, those are the two books that got me into Hans Hoppe. The democracy book really helped solidify me as an ANCAP, but those two are really, really amazing books because, you know, a lot of times you there, there are only so many ways you can say and argue certain things. So if I read five books on monetary theory, I'm going to have a lot of overlap. But I read books by Hans Hoppe, and I would say 90% of it is absolutely original. I've never read anything like this before. And that's very unusual. Now, of course, it would be nice also to do, but it's a huge book, but to do something someday with uh, Huerta de Soto's book, Money, Bank, Credit, and Economic Cycles. Mm -hmm. It's a gigantic book, but it's such a great book and an important book. In fact, it was it's so great that our friend David Howden, who was a Mises summer fellow and who now is a professor in Spain, David Howden read that book as a student and was so impressed by it that he decided he had to learn Spanish so that he could go get a PhD under the author of that book. Like that's that's pretty impressive. Well, and that's the goal. The goal is to reach people perhaps more narrowly but also more deeply. And we're hoping that we're going to spark something in someone, whether just a lifetime of learning purely for personal edification or a career change or a light bulb moment, an aha moment for somebody. I mean, that's really the reason that we're reviewing these books. And the other thing, Tom, is I have avoided getting into the broader – I don't know if I want to say libertarian sphere, but this the sphere of popular books, because the the idea of the podcast here is to be really unique and really different. Nobody else is out there, you know, actually reading and discussing econ books in podcast format. Russ Roberts' podcast is a little bit of that, but that's just not, not particularly about books, and certainly not about older or established books. So there's you know there's that way there, we sort of carved out a niche, and we've accepted the limitations of the niche because we're not doing a you know, it's not a Nickelback video with girls in bikinis. You know, it's it's a, a, a podcast where you might have to do some work and some thinking, and that's okay. Uh, but that said, you know, I, I don't want to read Jordan Peterson. I don't want to read um, the the latest greatest Bitcoin book necessarily. I stuck to Safedine, which is about all the all the Bitcoin we've done on the show. 
Um, I don't necessarily want to read much about libertarian theory because I think once you get past in the just in the 20th century, forget all the centuries that came before. You know, you, just in the 20th century, you have Nozick, um, you have uh, Albert J. Nock, you have uh, the the Tannehills. You have Rothbard introducing, making the normative case in the ethics of liberty. You have Hoppe expanding on that. I, I'm not sure that there's a lot of just pure libertarian theory that interests me a- anymore. I'm not, I'm not sure how much more scholarship there's left to be done in that area. So it's, it's – you know, there's – we have to f- sort of strike a balance between b- books that are interesting – and appealing to people, but also uh, books that are rigorous enough or lasting enough uh, that that we don't get sucked into sort of uh, popular reviews. Well, let me make a a couple of uh, recommendations. and These won't come as a surprise to you, but they're ones that I like and that I think deserve more attention. Even though it is a normative book, maybe you can make an exception in this case, Guido Holzman's book, The Ethics of Money Mm -hmm. Production. Sure. Yeah, that's that's he makes a very, very interesting, unique, and convincing case there and there is plenty of economics in that, and then another one would be uh, Rothbard's book on the Great Depression. Now, did you mention that one? No, I did not. Because that's a good one. Because uh, there is there's history in it, there's economics in it, and there is some controversy in it because of the definition of the money supply and stuff like that. But that would be a good one for Joe Salerno to be a guest for, because that is a an absolutely tremendous work, and, and you read it. And what I love about it is, yes, you get the Austrian theory of the business cycle, you get the revisionist history of Herbert Hoover, but then you look at the footnotes and stuff, and Rothbard knows that this guy was married to this woman who was connected to this <laughs> bank. and who I don't know how he found out all this stuff, but my gosh, it's like he knew everything. So it's very, very worth reading. And, and again, he makes a very convincing case, and it's an important topic because some of our people get the Great Depression wrong. And for heaven's sake, we're going on a hundred years since it happened. It's about time we figured that one out. Well, I definitely think that we want to make the Human Action Podcast a part of people's lives in this coming year. You know, maybe we really are at a spot where you ought to be uh, doing deadlifts and uh, canning food and uh, buying bullets and that sort of thing. But even if you are doing that, you need to be working on your mind as well. And I think there's no easier and uh, better place to do that than every Friday or thereabouts with the Human Action Podcast, because we're gonna we got a lot of books to read, and we're gonna make it easier for you. We're gonna make it more fun for you. We're gonna continue to provide discounts in the bookstore. Uh, tell your friends. You can find us at Google Podcasts, at Apple Podcasts, at Stitcher, at SoundCloud, and at Spotify. You all know how to find Tom and his great show, the Tom Woods Show. Follow him on Twitter at Thomas E Woods. And we look forward to having him join us at least once or twice to to cover a couple of books, maybe even one he wrote in the coming year. So, Tom, with all that said, I I want to wish you and yours a very happy new year and the same to our listeners. Thank you, Jeff. Same to you. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.